Hey everyone, uh, we are here for our next session. We have Itzik, uh, Director of Engineering at Enigma. He'll be doing a talk on deep dive into smart contract privacy and pub uh, public blockchains. And I'll let him take it from here. Can you guys just confirm in the chat you can hear him? Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, Mike check one, two, one, two. Um, I'll answer the burning question on everyone's mind. Um, Guy is not here, um, but his accent is much better. Um, and I'll be handling this talk. Um, so yeah, a bit about me. Um, my name's Itzik, uh, based in Tel Aviv. Uh, been around the block a bit, uh, mostly in elite units, uh, doing cybersecurity in the IDF, um, but also in the uh, startup scene of Tel Aviv. Um, currently, I'm a VP of engineering at Enigma, which is a core contributor of the secret network. Um, and you know, when I'm not, uh, grinding it out, um, or when I'm not in quarantine. Uh, I love playing soccer, um, and you can't be an Israeli without uh, giving a shout out to Hummus. Um, yeah, so these are my uh, socials as well. Uh, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, so let's get started. Um, two main topics on the agenda. Um, the first is we're going to do a brief overview of Secret Network, um, what it is, how it works. And the second is uh, I'll take you through our uh, design and development process of our first secret contract, the first uh, privacy preserving uh, application on the secret network. Um, so we start with a secret network. Um, and if you haven't heard uh, the tagline of secret network, secret network is a blockchain that lets anyone perform computations on encrypted data, bringing privacy to smart contracts and public blockchains. Um, that's a pretty long winded sentence uh, that basically means uh, Ethereum, but everything's encrypted. Um, so you can remember either of those, whichever is easier for you. Um, and what do I mean by everything's encrypted? Um, so if we take a look at the secret network and what it's made of, um, so that's a uh, secret network is a blockchain um, built on Cosmos and Tendermint. Um, but it also has programmable privacy, and that's achieved by running contracts inside a trusted execution environment. Um, our contracts are based on Cosmwasm. Um, if you don't know what that is, that's fine. It's basically Rust code, uh, which is compiled to WebAssembly. And interaction with those contracts is fully encrypted. So everything going in, going out, all the computation, that's all encrypted. Another important feature is uh, that every node runs every computation. Um, so there's no uh, sharding, no side chains, uh, none of that stuff. Uh, classic blockchain, everybody does everything, including running uh, those private computations. Um, that means that you can spin up a node. Uh, we have no permissions uh, as long as you have compatible hardware. Um, and the last uh, most important point is that everything I just described is running on mainnet, has been since mid-September, um, and we're super excited about it. Um, so just like another uh, bit more uh, in detail about what you know transactions look like, uh, what do I mean by everything going in and out is encrypted? Um, so we start with a regular transaction. A user wants to send something. Um, and that user encrypts uh, his input. And that encryption is done transparently. Um, all the tooling of the secret network does that for you. Um, so it encrypts the data and encrypts it in such a way that only inside our trusted execution environment, which is a hardware segregated environment, only there can the data be decrypted. Um, and once the computation is, per is uh, done in that environment, it's then encrypted again. Uh, and that data can only be read, that encrypted output can only be read um, by the user that set the transaction. The last part of that is something that we call state. Um, that would be the data that is uh, transferred over um, between transactions. What do I mean by that? I mean like uh, long lasting data. For example, you, know, you have um, a token and you want to save a user's balance. Um, so that's something that has to be saved and updated. Uh, and that's also encrypted. So that was um, super high level of the secret network. Um, and now that we're on the same page, uh, we know that we have this uh, program, pr programmable privacy platform, uh, which is super powerful. Uh, we can do all kinds of uh, cool applications. Um, so we have to get started somewhere. Um, and where do you get started? Well, you know, DeFi is pretty big these days. 
you know, everybody loves DeFi. Um, and what, what are the, what is, what is the building block of DeFi? What is like the main thing at the core of DeFi? Um, that's tokens, um, whether you use them on an AMM, uh, whether you, you issue, I don't know, governance tokens, you know, whatever you want to do, any kind of trading, anything that's all tokens. Um, and we also, uh, decided we need a token, but we're a secret network. So, you know, we're not going to have any regular token. Uh, we're going to have a secret token. And what do I mean by secret token? Um, well, if you think about what uh, Zcash is to Bitcoin, secret tokens are to ERC-20s. Um, so we have uh, transactional privacy uh, with a, a token that you can issue, transfer, um, and do all the stuff that you would expect from you know, your regular ERC-20 tokens. Um, so I'll take you through um, how we created you know, this secret token. Um, and we started pretty basic. We started saying, OK, um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want everything to be familiar. So we start from the ERC-20 spec. Um, our contracts are written in Rust. So you know, write up some Rust code, uh, easy peasy. Um, and deploy it on the secret network, which has all this great you know, encryption stuff. Um, and there we go, privacy coin, right? Um, so uh, that wouldn't be a very interesting talk if that's all I had for you. Um, so I'll take you through um, some of the lessons and some of uh, the design decisions we made uh, starting out on this journey. Um, so I wasn't lying. We did, really did start with the ERC-20 spec. Um, and once you start reading it and you start going over it, uh, thinking about privacy, um, there are some things that kind of stick out. Um, and the first is that all your balances are public. So everybody can tell uh, how many tokens everybody else has, not very private. Um, and the second is that all the transactional data is public as well. So you know who sent tokens, where did he send them, how many tokens did he send them. Um, and that's, again, not very private. Um, so. The first solution you could think of is, you know, let's uh, instead of being able to just, you know, ask what balance anybody has, uh, we'll create a new function. We'll call it, I don't know, get balance or something, and we'll make that get balance function require a transaction on chain, which will have to be signed by the user. Um, that will authenticate him um, and provide privacy. Um, in addition, Secret Network um, has all that encryption stuff that I mentioned at the beginning. So everything is hidden, right? All the transactional information is not public anymore. So now we're done, right? Um, no, not, not, not quite. Um, requiring a user to pay gas to ask how many tokens he has is not a great solution um, for many, very many number of reasons. Um, but also, you know, you you don't want that experience. You know, you don't want somebody to sign a ledger transaction just to refresh their balance. Um, and when you're creating uh, a new standard, um, you want to think about both like the UX and the DevX. And what I mean by that is like how will wallets integrate with this token solution? Um, and we want that to be as easy as possible. Um, so. You know, we have to go a bit further than that. And basically, um, these issues boil down uh, to two things. The first is how do users query their private data? Um, and the, secondly, the second thing is how wallets um, and other third-party applications can query data on behalf of their users. So if I have a wallet, um, I definitely would want it to be able to uh, let me know how many tokens I have. Um, and if I want, uh, I don't know, to integrate with uh, Etherscan or something, I want Etherscan to be able to tell me the same thing uh, or you know, the secret equivalent of Etherscan. Um, so our solution to that is something that we call uh, viewing keys. And what a viewing key is, is basically an API key um, that is known both to the contract and to the user. Um, and that allows uh, the holder of that uh, viewing key or anybody who knows it um, to be able to query uh, that read-only uh, data at the private data. Um, but that sort of begs the question, how do we get these keys? Like, how does the user and the contract, how do they agree on 
this key? Uh, what's the mechanism uh, that goes on here? Um, and we have to think about that a bit um, because there are two main approaches. And the first approach is you have the contract generate a key and tell the user about it. So that's like an API key. Um, and the second is you let the user choose. That would basically be a password. Um, and there are some things that you have to think about since you're running on blockchain. And things are kind of different. Um, so you have to think about things a little bit differently. And the first is um, that brute force is simple and side channels are a thing. Um, and why, why is that uh, different than what we're used to? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, all the nodes run all the contracts. You know, everything is running on every node. So theoretically, your code that you're writing in your contract will run on an attacker's machine. And he will be able to uh, examine the code. He will be able to you know, query your code. Uh, he can uh, attack it in pretty cost-effective ways uh, for him, especially compared to um, what we're used to from web applications, which are you know, more mature in that regard. Um, the third thing is that um, that's not a blockchain specific thing, but you know, relying on users to choose uh, strong passwords is uh, kind of uh, suspicious. Um, and you also have to explain to them what this thing is. What, what, why do they have to choose a strong password? What are they protecting? Um, which complicates uh, the UX a bit. Uh, and the last thing is, you know, I mentioned, uh, I sort of skipped over this. Like I said, contract generates a key. Um, but you know, if you think about it, what I said was uh, the contract generates a random API key uh, running on blockchain, which is deterministic. Um, that's you know something pretty uh, non-trivial to think about. Um, so we sort of put our heads together and we thought a bit about um, how uh, we can get a solution that you know provides the best of both worlds. Um, and we came up with uh, a way that we think uh, that we really like, um, and that's uh, get entropy from the user and use a pseudo random number generator to generate uh, his viewing key. Um, and how do we do that? Because that's uh, another concept that uh, you won't find on public blockchains. It's only you know on these uh, on secret network. Uh, or other privacy chains. Um, this is something that you can do. And the way we do it is we feed our pseudo random number generator. And I'll mention that you know, we're running Rust code, uh, not Solidity for our contract. So we can use these mature crypto building blocks like random number generators um, and just drop them in and not have to rewrite everything from scratch and not have to roll our own crypto, which is super strong. And that's the only reason why we can do things like this. Um, so we take this random number generator and we feed it entropy from two sources. The first is transactional data. And what I mean by that is interactions with the contract, uh, user transactions, for example. Um, and you can gather data from those either implicitly or explicitly depends you know, what you want to do. Um, and what I mean by that is like you can either um, gather metadata about the transaction. For example, you know, I don't know how many tokens the user sent, where did he send them, from where did they come? Um, or you can just explicitly gather entropy, which is you know, add a field that uh, has to be sent, which contains a random string, and just throw that into the random number generator. Um, so that's the first type of transactional entropy. And the second is uh, entropy that is public, um, but hard to predict. Um, so that's like block numbers, block times, um, all kinds of parameters that, while everybody knows what they are, um, if you try to predict them in advance, you'd have a hard time. Um, so we sort of uh, end up with this random number generator that works pretty well, can generate uh, brute force resistant API keys, um, but also minimizes user interaction. What I mean by that is that the interaction from the user can be abstracted away um, by wallets, sorry, or by other tools. Um, so we feel that's sort of like a best of both worlds. Um, in that regard. So we have this viewing key, um, but what are we actually viewing? Um, and that's another thing that we encounter while uh, 
we started working, you know, on these secret contracts where on public blockchains, like, you know, if you think Ethereum, a lot of the features that you sort of take for granted um, are enabled by the fact that everything is public. So if I wanted to create um, an application that shows you, you know, all your transactional history, like everywhere you sent, you know, tokens or something, um, that's pretty easy to do. I just have to, you know, query the chain, um, you know, order that uh, data and present it to you, no problem. Um, but on privacy chains, things are a bit different. Um, and you sort of have to do this mind shift where, you know, you shift away from thinking about uh, everything being public and you go back to thinking about data in a database uh, on your server. And if you want users to access data from the database, you have to create interfaces to that data and you have to create access control to that data. Um, and that makes things a little bit more complicated, um, but that's one of those, it's a feature, not a bug thing, because we're doing uh, privacy and we're doing privacy by default. Uh, so we want everything not to be, a bit of, be available unless we specifically make it so. Um, and in our case, that means that um, every transaction uh, that you do with secret tokens are uh, stored in a record that saves both the, the sender, uh, the amount, uh, the recipient, and other metadata about the transaction. And it's stored in such a way that both parties can then access that record using their viewing keys. Um, so you can tell who sent you uh, tokens, um, when did they send you tokens? How much did they send? And of course, you know, if you wanted to create a model where this data wasn't available, no problem. Just don't add this data. Um, just don't add this function. Um, so you can pretty much customize whatever you need. Um, and the last thing is, um, and I mentioned this a bit before, side channels. Um, it turns out you actually have to know a bit about the blockchain you're running on to write good code, uh, write private code. Um, and the first is you have to remember that uh, your code is running on an attacker's machine. Uh, constant time uh, equations are your friend. Um, and because we can use these building blocks that are written in Rust uh, natively, then uh, we can deal with these things pretty well. Um, the second thing is that um, I mentioned like all the transactions are encrypted and I keep on saying that, um, but you also have to make sure that even though the data is encrypted, you're not leaking anything through that encryption. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean, like um, you have to make sure that uh, the data that you're returning to the user, that everybody can read the encrypted data, the length doesn't change according to the, you know, what happened. So if I sent um, one token or I sent, you know, 10 million tokens, uh, you have to make sure that you know what is returned uh, is has a constant length and doesn't leak information there. Um, and the last thing to think about is uh, storage access. And what I mean by that is I uh, mean the encrypted state. Um, so our state is encrypted. Um, however, access to that state is available. So you can see um, not what data has been read or write read or written. Um, but how many times they did that. So, you know, you can see uh, the state was accessed twice, uh, once for read and once for write, for example. Um, and that may leak certain information about your contract, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, it's something to think about, uh, which may or may not be relevant, uh, but you have to be aware of it uh, when you're creating uh, private applications. Yeah, um, so that was, you know, a brief about, you know, how we got to uh, this stage where we created these, uh, the secret token uh, standard, the secret token contract. Uh, we're going to deploy a polished production ready version on mainnet this week, which we are super excited about. Um, and that will be uh, the first building block of private DeFi on secret network. And by that, I mean transactional privacy I mean, a uh, front running resistant and privacy preserving AMM. Uh, I'm talking about staking derivatives, uh, bridges to other blockchains. Uh, we actually talked in our blog about a bridge to Ethereum. Uh, very interesting read, uh, check it out. Um, and uh, much more cool stuff. Um, 
coming uh, very soon. Um, yeah, so uh, final uh, takeaways. Um, everything I talked about here is sort of, you know, I, it's like nothing should be surprising, you know, in terms of concepts. Um, everything is trivial if you're talking about standard web app development, generating API keys, for example. Um, but once you start doing that on blockchain and trying to preserve privacy, everything becomes uh, a little bit harder. And you have to think about things a little bit more. Um, and what that means is that you can't just copy paste your, you know, standard smart contracts uh, to a secret network, to any privacy chain, and expect them to work. Um, not in a privacy-preserving way, anyway. Um, so you can't take uh, Uniswap, uh, deploy it, and have secret Uniswap. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and that's not very surprising, because um, also, you know, if you want to write secure code, you can't have security as an afterthought. It has to be built into your design process, and you have to keep thinking about it and keep reevaluating the code that you're writing. Um, yeah, um, so that was most of it. Um, if I said anything that sounds interesting, you want to learn more, um, all our code is open source. Um, check it out. Uh, join our community. Uh, ping, us, ping us on Discord, on Telegram, uh, wherever. Um, we're super happy to engage, answer questions. Uh, yeah, and everything. So uh, I think that's about it. How much time do I have left? I have nine minutes, I think. Awesome. Um, let's tackle some questions. Um, yeah, thanks, James, for shouting out the links. Uh, hopefully, the slides will be available. Um, OK. so. Um, let's talk about uh, questions. OK. Ts are notoriously insecure. What does Secret do to protect against side channel attacks and other attacks on Ts used in Secret Network hardware? Um, so this is like an ongoing process. Um, Ts, I would not say, are notoriously insecure. Um, they do have some uh, theoretical attacks, uh, none seen in the wild as far as I know. Um, but what we do do is enforce uh, that all the hardware is patched to the highest level um, and that everybody is running uh, compliant hardware um, and they get their patches in in time. And you know, it's not nothing is foolproof, right? Um, but we feel that this is like a good first step. This is like um, what, HTTPS or what SSL is uh, in the web world, where you sort of take it for granted. Nobody thinks SSL is like um, a, like this, um, you know, super secure, you know, unhackable, you know, no bugs ever in open SSL thing. Um, but it's a baseline that you just come to expect. You won't put your credit card information if you know you don't see that lock uh, up top. Um, so we feel that this is a huge, huge, huge step forward. How do you enforce that the T is not an emulation? Um, so the T has um, attestation. That means that you sort of make sure uh, you validate that you're running uh, hardware, uh, that you have all the hardware chips, uh, and they contain uh, certificate and non-forgeable information so that you know, if you have an emulation, you just won't be able to authenticate uh, with the network. Constant time algorithms are inefficient and result in similar processing times as snark start processes. Uh, where do you see the break value value from these? Um, honestly, if you want to use uh, snark or start processes uh, on secret network, you're more than uh, welcome to. I mentioned constant time algorithms because we can deploy them in our contracts uh, when we get them for free. Uh, we can just take this code, deploy it. It's super easy, um, and that's something that's you know just not available like on solidity that's like a change in thinking um so you know my, my point is just you know go crazy can a contract code be too private um security is always 
like a sort of like a risk assessment uh, process where you know you have to look at your code, think uh, what it, what do I want to protect against? What are my assets here? Uh, then you think, okay, what are you know? How do we attack that? How much would it cost an attacker uh, to attack that? Um, and then you sort of uh, work from there and think about your solutions. Um, so yes, a contract can be too private if it tries to do too much, um, and it's you know trying to protect things that don't matter. Um, will privacy tokens cr created using SCRT and ERC20 have a UX that is too cumbersome for widespread adoption? I hope not. <laughs> um, the way I see it, like uh, we're working with wallet providers. Um, to standardize the secret token standard in such in like a similar way to ERC20 tokens. So it's just like you have your MetaMask today that allows you to see like ERC20 tokens and you know all that complexity with tokens and contracts is abstracted away. Um, that's what we want to achieve for secret tokens. And the reason I went into all this, you know, uh, 20 minute explanation about secret tokens um, is that um, we wanted to create the tools to provide that UX. Viewing keys are specifically there, um, so the experience will be uh, as simple as possible while still maintaining everybody's privacy. Um, yeah, OK, uh, let's go through chat. Um, somebody said that the TLS 1.3 is uh, super strong and amazing. You are correct. TLS is a really good protocol. Implementations, however, are not. Um, and there are bugs, and there will be bugs. Um, and these things happen. Like um, you, you don't break AES anymore, um, but you look for implementation bugs. Uh, that's where the money is. Um, that's why you know governments use their own crypto and they don't you know use SSL. Um, what else? What else? What else? Um, yeah, I think we are pretty much done here. If I did not answer, or I missed any of your questions. Um, ping me, you know, anywhere. Um, let me know. I'll be happy to, you know, discuss this further. Um, yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah, this was great. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to transition to our next talk now.